From Hollywood, it's out of my mind. I'm Jay Douglas, and in episode 13, we're going from invention to interruption, all the while keeping an eye out for the signpost up ahead. It's your 17 minutes of the essential, non-essential, and curiously essential information we find scattered all over the world and assemble every week for baby boomers like you who haven't lost their curiosity. Now, if you're not a baby boomer, you can still listen to the show. All you have to do is describe where you were when you first saw the Beatles and not mention YouTube, history class, or Wikipedia. It's going to be the talk of the town as episode 13 begins with the truth. This is the story of an entrepreneur. You know his name, but you probably don't know that you know it. He didn't write computer programs, analyze big data, make over healthcare, or design silicon chips. As historian Kevin Kurbitz tells it, this entrepreneur's first business, which he started with a partner, made toilets, and then they went into other plumbing supply businesses. Our entrepreneur's legacy invention is not something you call Mike Diamond to repair, though you do use it sitting down. Kevin Kurbitz is not only a historian, he's a renowned expert in the life of David Dunbar Buick, who went from rags to riches to rags to riches to rags to riches to rags. Along the way, Dave Buick played a critical role in the formation of General Motors. But I'm getting ahead of things. First, we have to get Dave Buick out of the toilet uh, business. You look at, at what his patents were in the plumbing business, you can really see how a lot of the details transferred over to the, uh, the gasoline engine. You, know, you look at just the brass castings for a valve or the brass casting for a carburetor, and um, you, you can control the flow of water with the valve, and you control the flow of, of air and fuel with the carburetor. Um, a lot of the, the basic principles are kind of the same. So 1895, he was experimenting with gasoline engines, and by 1899, the first Buick automobile was built in Detroit. There we go. Now, all Dave Buick needed was luck and money. Lots of money. And more than a little luck. A lot of investors have been burned by um, Henry Ford um, with uh, his second um, venture into the car business and um, had a hard time raising money. So he was selling his engines to a company in Flint called the Flint Wagon Works. They were interested in buying the company and that, that they moved Buick to Flint in late 1903 called the Buick Motor Company. With the income from building gasoline engines, Buick had the capital to back development of the car that bore his name. Until he didn't. The folks at the Flint Wagon Works uh, wanted, a, uh, wanted somebody else to run the company. They just felt a better manager was in order. And they, they got Billy Durant. No longer in charge of his company, Dave Buick's automobile plans were running out of gas. Except Billy Durant was a successful industrialist and millionaire. And he didn't get that way by not knowing a good opportunity when he saw one. And he saw one in Buick. Billy Durant turned it into like an overnight success where Buick had built 37 cars its first year. Durant um, built, I, I think the numbers in like 750 the second year of production. And then it just kept climbing from there. And by, uh, by 1908, Buick was doing so well that Durant uh, expanded. He created General Motors in 1908 based on the, the solid financial position that Buick was in. Dave Buick, who got in on the ground floor of General Motors was set for life. Until he wasn't. In 1910, Durant lost control of General Motors. And some, uh, some bankers came in, took control of the company, and all of a sudden the royalties that Buick was supposed to be paid quit coming. Buick was by no means poor. He had money in the bank and was recognized as a millionaire himself. And then... And then he went into the oil business in California. Hit a couple of gushers. The oil company fell into some, we'll call it shady promotional techniques. Uh, the company was sued, mail fraud, and uh, the, the, the case uh, was finally dismissed. But the, the funds that were being pumped in to defend uh, the Buick company just depleted a lot of its finances. Losing General Motors. Conned by a shady oil company. But none of this was the end for Dave Buick, entrepreneur. He was designing carburetors while he was in California still. And he licensed the manufacturer to, uh, to another company in Michigan. And he was getting royalties from that. Buick bounced back. He had money again, 
and this time he wasn't going to throw it into some hole in the ground. No, this time he was going to lose it topside. He then went to Florida in about um, 1924, and he became involved with land development. Uh, He started a company, or a, a city, a real estate development called Buick City Realty. Uh, in central Florida. Timing was bad. Location was great, but there was a a land bust, and he lost his fortune there, too. By 1926, David Dunbar Buick was 72 years old. He'd made and lost three fortunes. Now he was losing his health. He wound up back in Detroit in uh, 1926. He was an instructor with the Detroit School of Trades. Uh, He was finally interviewed in 1928 by uh, Bruce Catton, uh, found him at the, at the information desk of the School of Trade. So his health had declined to where that was all he was doing was working at the, at the front desk. When the stock market crashed in 1929, David Dunbar Buick didn't lose what little he had left. He had died in poverty a few months earlier. History never recorded the last time he was able to afford a Buick of his own. Today, Few people know that Buick was named after an inventor and an entrepreneur and wasn't the result of some focus group testing. We don't remember people that die poor, unfortunately. We remember people that, that, that die millionaires and leave, leave their, their heirs lots and lots of money. It's rather sad. Kevin Kerbitz is an engineering manager with General Motors, and he began his career with Buick. He's also a historian, a member of the board of trustees of the Durant Dork Carriage Company Foundation, and a member of the board of the Buick Heritage Alliance. Kevin has some interesting anecdotes about Buick automobiles, including the origin of the insignia on the front and the reason Buicks had portholes in the 1950s and 60s. You'll find these episode extras on our YouTube channel. Go to Out of My Mind Podcast on YouTube.com. That's Out of My Mind Podcast on YouTube.com. Click on playlists and choose extras. Tom Mabe has been called a comic superhero. And like any good superhero, he's dedicated to protecting us from evildoers. So here's some advice. If your evil doing includes calling people during the dinner hour and telling them they've won a free cruise or that they qualify for some overpriced mortgage, don't call Tom. Yes, can I speak with Tom Mabe? Who's calling? Well, this is Mike Stewart with Network. You've been selected to receive a complete digital satellite system for free. With this, you're going to... Oh, no, no, let me ask you something. Did, did you know Tom Mabe? Were you a fan of his? No, I'm not. I'm just calling to... Uh, oh, hold, 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 hold that thought. Hold on one second, all right? Hold. Hey, guys, get really good pictures of the body. Yeah, and dust everything down for prints. Mike, you there? Yeah. <laughs> let me bring you up to speed. You've actually called a murder scene. Uh, Mr. Mabe is no longer with us. I'm Officer Clark. I'm, I'm conducting a homicide investigation. Uh, I want to ask you a series of questions. Uh, first of all, what was the nature of the business you had with uh, Tom Mabe? Well, I, I I had no business with him. I'm, I, I'm sorry to bother you. No, no, hey, hold on. Look, I want to ask you to stay on the phone. This call's already been traced, and we may need you to come in for further questioning. Just, uh, uh, Steve, you, you don't understand. I, I'm just calling on... No, no, look, you don't understand. Unless you want to be charged with obstruction of justice, it's imperative you keep your ass on the phone, Mike. Well, how about you just talk with my supervisor then? No, 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 look, 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 we'll get your supervisor in a second here. First of all, give me your whereabouts. I'm at work. You're at work? Yeah. You being a smart ass? No, sir. Let me put it to you this way, Mike. Say, say I want to mail your ass a letter. What would I have to write on the outside of that envelope to ensure the mailman would deliver it right to your ass? Geographically speaking, Mike, where is work? 47 West Street. Hold on, that's 4780. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, hold on one second, all right? Yes, sir. Get the Littleton Police Department homicide division on the phone. Uh, Give them this information. Tell him he's being a sock connection with a fatal shooting and aggravated robbery. Uh, Mike, how did you know Mr. Mabe again? Wait, you're calling the Littleton Police Department? I'm hundreds of miles away. I, I don't even know the guy. I'm I'm in Colorado. No, don't don't let that scare you. That's just a formality. I mean, have you ever been to his place of residence? No. 
All right, and tell, tell me again, where were you last night for 20 hours of 8 and 10? I'm not feeling real comfortable by any of this. Hey, have you even ever spoken with Mr. May, Mike? No, I haven't. I don't even know the guy. I have to, that's what I've been trying to tell Okay, you. okay, just calm down. Calm down. Hold on. Look, just back up. I got one more question for you, Mike. As you well know, I'm sure... Mr. May was a flaming homosexual, and there's no easy way of asking that. I don't want to embarrass you or nothing, but were you his gay lover? What? No. What, what the hell? Kind of a quick... Look, 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 look. If gay is your way, that's okay. I still know there's a lot of you gay people in that closet. I'm not saying I haven't thought about myself, you know. Say I was in Las Vegas or something, a couple drinks, cute little Mexican midget. This is Sam ridiculous. Caleb? Tom Mabe started out to be a songwriter, but fate tapped him to be a comic superhero, as well as a corporate comedian, prankster, evitiator of the annoyances of modern day life, and occasional guest on the Bob and Tom syndicated radio show. My thanks to Tom for his permission to use his telemarketer takedown recording in today's episode. You can hear more from Tom on his YouTube channel, Mabe in America. I've put a link to it in the show notes. Go to outofmymindpodcast.com. That's outofmymindpodcast.com. Click on episode 13 and follow the link to show notes. If you're listening on YouTube, click on the Read Show Notes banner that will appear near the end of the show. I knew my dad was a writer from an early age, but I didn't know exactly what he was writing until I watched, or until uh, some mean kid on the playground asked me if I was something out of the Twilight Zone. And I didn't know what the Twilight Zone was, so I went home and asked my father, and he explained uh, that it was a show he wrote, that it was a little too old for me, and... Uh, My recollection of that whole scene is he and I were watching the Flintstones together and uh, what Wilma was saying to Fred at that point was more interesting than any more than he was going to tell me about this show. That's Ann Serling, daughter of writer Rod Serling. It was this week in 1959, October 2nd to be exact, that the CBS television network aired the first episode of The Twilight Zone, which Mr. Serling created and for which he wrote 92 of the 156 episodes. I called his daughter Anne because I was curious to know what it was like growing up as the daughter of a man who could conjure up stories that, as Rod Serling said at the show's opening, lay between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. What I found out was not at all what I imagined. It was really a very um, normal childhood. He was very good friends with uh, Betty White and Carol Burnett, but that's really the extent of any kind of celebrity exposure that we had. My dad and my mother, mostly, they hung out with the writers and producers. And, you know, I do vividly remember begging my dad to meet um, Elizabeth Montgomery. And uh, she couldn't come over. And so then I begged to meet Sherry Lewis. And, uh, in fact, when I wrote about this in my book, I wrote that she brought lamb chop, and my editor said that I needed to correct this because the way I'd written it is it sounded like she brought lamb chop for us to have for dinner. Granted, I never had Sherry Lewis bring lamb chop for dinner, but my aunt brought matzo ball soup once for Passover. If anything, Anne's relationship with her father, a man who was driven to write by circumstances I'll get to in a moment, was closer than that of many of my friends. Their fathers were often on the road on business, or leading the life of William White's organization man. I never had the sense, and I wrote this in my book, that he wasn't available and he wasn't present. I mean, my recollection is coming home from school and he, he and I would play basketball every afternoon. Uh, he was always there at the dinner table. You know, he was always there. All of this is taking place when Anne was very young. She was four when The Twilight Zone premiered. So there were facets of her father she didn't know about or didn't fully understand until much later. One of these was what drove him to write 12 hours a day and write about topics familiar to Twilight Zone viewers. Prejudice, injustice, human rights. What I referred to a minute ago as the circumstances that drove him were the experiences he had in World War II. My my dad had originally planned to major in phys ed when he went to Antioch College and he soon switched to language and literature because, as he said, he needed to get it out of his gut. He needed to get it off his chest. And, and writing became that vehicle to do that. And here's where our story takes an interesting turn. One, I think, that demonstrates the bond between Anne and her father. 
In 1975, Anne suffered her own defining moment. Her father died of a heart attack. She was 20 years old. Her loss was unbearable, and her grief blocked her from discovering or rediscovering more about her father, whose public notoriety developed when she was too young to fully grasp it. She needed to get beyond her grief and learn more about the father who was never too busy to shoot hoops or let her best him in a game of paddle tennis. And like her father, she turned to writing. I think actually writing the book was played a huge part in that recovery. And it was difficult for me to be so open about my grief, and I actually have to credit my editor because she said, your grief is so central to this book, you have to be more open. And when she said that, I just let it go. The book Anne is referring to is As I Knew Him, a sensitive memoir and a journey of self and family discovery. It was a long, emotional, and difficult project. For Anne, writing As I Knew Him gave her the strength to connect with the part of her father's life she was too young to appreciate at the time. I didn't even watch many of the Twilight Zones until after my dad died. And initially, that was just to see him. Did the shows, which for me portrayed a rather stern man, almost the image of a college professor lecturing to a class in philosophy, change her image of her father? Not in the sense that uh, it changed the image. I mean, my dad, in, in my memory, and is, was you know just sort of this funny, silly guy who, who was passionate about certain things that he should have been passionate about. He was really you know, t- talking about the human condition and social issues and moral issues. And um, I think, if anything, I, I had even more respect for him. Anne Serling is the daughter of Rod Serling and an author in her own right. Besides As I Knew Him, she has written poetry and is working on Aftershock, a novel about the dissolution of the family and ultimately the triumph of the human spirit. I'll put a link to her website in the show notes. And speaking of Twilight, it's closing in on episode 13 of Out of My Mind. My thanks to Kevin Kerbitz, Ann Serling, and Tom Mabe for being part of the program, and to you for listening, and for supporting the show by sharing it with your friends and getting them to subscribe. I'm not going to ask how you do that, but thanks. Keep it up. If you have trouble getting a friend or relative to subscribe to the show, I'll be glad to call them personally. Send me their name, phone number, and the time they eat dinner, and unless their last name is Mabe, I'll take care of it. In the meantime, I'll have a new show for you and them next Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern. Let's talk then. I'm Jay Douglas. Out of My Mind is produced by Penny Summers and is a production of the Theater of Your Mind Incorporated, Hollywood, California. California.